I know that's the verse I put up last week, but I didn't want to scare you with this one. That's scary. Hebrews chapter 2, turn there. Hebrews chapter 2. Appreciate everybody's prayers. Um, Lisa had a pretty long week this week, and uh, but she is doing a little better this morning. So I appreciate everybody praying for her, praying for me. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter two, talking about the power. That Satan has. Um, our key text is in 2 Corinthians 11. I should have had you go there, but we've been there so many times. And it says, No marvel, Hebrews 11:14, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing of his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. If Satan has power, then he gives that power. Does that make sense? If he has power, he gives that power. We know in, in Revelation 13 that he gives his power, his seat, and great authority over to the beast. We also then believe that his ministers are going to have certain powers. Now I'm going to be touching on that probably tonight or this afternoon when we're talking about devils, but he gives his people powers. I've been in contact with somebody this week. It's been very troubling, but it's been a little bit enlightening. Some people are being influenced by, some, some church people have been influenced by people who say there's nothing wrong with Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and all that stuff for Christians. I stand adamantly opposed to that. Amen? I read The Lord of the Rings when I was in high school. I read The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien thought that you could, t and C.S. Lewis, thought you could teach Christ by teaching mythology. And it's not true. Peter said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Amen? We don't do that. We don't... You don't tell something that's not true in order to tell something that is true. You don't lie to speak the truth. And these cunningly divide, and all that stuff is about wizardry, um, warlocks, magic, witchcraft, things like that. We don't, you just don't do that. But some people have been influenced by that and it's just, it's just troubled me all week. So anyway, I can't tell you who it is. I can't tell you who it is, very confidential, and, but there's some people that have just been influenced by that, and they need prayer. Anyway, does the devil have the power to take life? We talked about that a little bit last week. We know that Satan had the power to take Job's children's life, and he did. He would have taken Job's life had God not put barriers on him and said I've got a hedge around him and you're not going to touch him so Hebrews chapter two, uh, chapter 2 let's look there uh, let's go back a little bit to oh let's see here Hebrews chapter 2 let's go back to verse 11 to get our context for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. The Old Testament word is congregation. So the Bible's telling you they mean virtually the same thing. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. And then verse 14 is the text I have up on the screen. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same now get this, that through death, and he in this text is Christ, 
that through death he, Christ, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. When somebody dies, the devil took their life. But God allowed it. Does that make sense? Okay? When somebody dies, the devil... There's this idea that there is a death angel. Big hooded guy with a big scimitar reaping life, I guess, or taking life. Um, I would say that more than likely that idea comes from the scriptures and it is the devil. Where does he get that power? Go back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Did I tell you I was tired this morning? John chapter 8. Let's go to verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? You ever heard that from somebody? Oh, I don't read the King James because I don't, I don't understand it. Okay? Um, by the way, we used to support the Gideons. We don't. Not anymore. The hospital room that Lisa was in had a big Bible, big Gideon Bible in there. So I took a look. It ain't, it ain't King James anymore. They were using the English Standard Version. And it ain't, it ain't right. It ain't, it ain't, it it's not my shepherd's voice. Amen? My sheep know my voice, Jesus said. And it's just not the shepherd's voice. But why do you not understand my speech in verse 43, John 8? Even because you cannot hear my word. And then he says, very, very serious tone Christ is taking here. He said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Notice this. He was a murderer from where? From the beginning. So we're going to, that's where we're going to go here in a minute. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. But the Bible says he was a murderer from the beginning. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's Turn to Genesis 4. I'm gonna, we're going to eventually end up in Genesis 2, but I want you to look in Genesis 4. Genesis 4 is where the first murder shows up. And because we're in chapter 4, I think that there is a picture of the gospel here in Genesis 4. It's a proto-gospel because you have... In verse 8 of Genesis 4, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So the murderer, who put the idea of murder into Cain's mind, into Cain's heart? Okay, the Bible's, the, I think the Bible's teaching you that the devil did that. The devil inspired that. Um, the Bible says that Cain was of that wicked one. The Bible also says that Abel, I think, is a type of Christ because his, his sacrifice was accepted by God. Cain's sacrifice, of course, was not. It was rejected by God. Uh, you can look at a difference in verse 3 and 4. Cain offered the fruit of the ground, and one of the things that's wrong with the fruit of the ground is that it's been cursed with thorns and briars. But unto uh, Abel, he also brought of the firstling of the flock, which is a sort of a lifeblood sacrifice. There's no blood in grain. There's no blood in fruit. Uh, but there's blood in animals. That's just kind of the idea that I have. But anyway, Abel brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. 
So that's the first murder that's in the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, if you turn back there. Genesis chapter 2. You have the commandment. There's only one at this time. There was only one commandment. Can you imagine living life with one rule? One rule. One law. One, one thing. It's like, Adam, you had one thing to not do. One thing. Okay? That's like getting something that you bought. You ordered it. And it came to you, and you're excited to get it, and you open the box, and you find out that somebody at the factory was drunk, or they fell asleep, or whatever, and there was, it doesn't work. It was brand new, and it doesn't work. And the guy, you think, the guy at the factory had one thing to do, George, one thing to do, that is to make sure that it worked, and you got it, and it doesn't work. And now you got to send it back to Amazon or wherever you got it from. You got to send it back because it doesn't work. Adam had one commandment. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, And I want you to notice that I have those words underlined. Of every tree of the garden, thou mayest how? What's the adjective or adverb? Freely eat. Adverbs end in L-Y. Okay, thou mayest freely eat. So what could have Adam done? Anything that he wanted, he had access to. And it was given to him absolutely free. No restrictions, no requirements, nothing holding him back. He could have had whatever he wanted except just one tree but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die and in your king james bible i just counted these words one day there's 39 words exactly how many books are there in the old testament 39 you have in my opinion you have the law Right here. You have the law, you have the whole of the law. So, Romans chapter 5 tells us In this day there was one commandment, so there was one sin. So then, death came into the world because of Adam, because of that one sin. So, what God did was then God multiplied, He multiplied the law. You go from one commandment to ten. Now the law is multiplied. Now there's all these things that we cannot do. Cannot take somebody's property, thou shalt not steal. Cannot take somebody's wife, thou shalt not commit adultery. Cannot even, you cannot even, what was it I heard the other day? Oh, I really like that house. And I went, that's the first thing God said. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. First thing he said. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. First thing out of his mouth. Okay. Remember 2008? When the bubble burst, they said. What was it that caused the problem? Housing. Why? Because everybody, they said, I want the American dream. Well, then pay for it. You want that American dream? Get a job that, where you can afford the house that you covet after and then pay for it. Don't make everybody else pay for your mistakes. Am I wrong? I don't think. Yes, sir.
Yeah, they were paying the banks, but not paying for the house. Okay? And it was government loans or government-backed loans, and they told everybody, we'll give them houses that they can't afford, let them have it. And everybody said, well, that's the American dream. Yeah, but there was a day when you paid for it. Amen? But anyway, God multiplied the law. So now there's all these things that we want to do and cannot do. So what do we do? We did them. We did them. How is it that we can expect that we can try to keep the law and then please God with that. Raise your hand if you have kept the law. Not even I. Didn't keep it. So would we be any different than Adam in Eden? No. It's genetic. It's in us. To break, it's in our flesh to break God's law. Can I hear you say amen? Okay. Um, oh, I'm tired this morning. So I'm trying to think of verses. Romans 3.23. Uh, help me out. Yeah, for all of sin come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Okay. So all of us have broken the law, and our flesh still does, because it still wants to. Even if it's not those little dirty things, like wanting your neighbor's house, okay? You would say, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's the first thing that God said. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Then he threw in his wife and his servants and his, all his property and everything else that, that your neighbor had, well, that's a nice Makita drill you got there, dude. That's your neighbor's. You got a Black & Decker. Deal with it. Got it for Christmas. Deal with it. Okay? You're just not supposed to covet your neighbor's stuff, and that's what we do. We covet. Don't get out of it. But anyway, 39 words here. God gave one law. To Adam, and he gave a consequence for breaking that law, and that consequence was death. And we've all done it, so we've all, our bodies are going to die. We keep trying to maintain them, we keep trying to fix them up, but they're gonna die. So, Genesis chapter 3, look at what the serpent targeted. But he didn't go to Adam. Who did he go to? Adam's wife, the weaker vessel, the Bible says. The weaker vessel, not the strong one, the weak one. Think of your Bible. You have two covenants. I have two hands. One of them I can do stuff with, one of them I can't. Okay? So, you have two covenants. One is strong, one is weak. One will get you to heaven, one will not. Go look at the law, and go look what God promised by keeping the law. God promised an earthly land to Israel by keeping the law. They didn't even keep the law, they, so God took their land away. In the new covenant, God gives us a heavenly land by a new law. And what is that new law? Believe, faith, trust, okay? And the two laws that he gave us in the new covenant were love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. For on these two hang all the law and the prophets, he said, okay? Anyway, I'm spending a lot of time with that, but I think it's important. Genesis chapter 3, so look at who the devil targeted and look what he, look what he went after. He went after the one thing that God said don't do. So now that the law has been expanded, when he comes after us, he comes after those things that God said that we should do or that we should not do. 
He comes after those things. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, questioning God's word, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And, of the, woman, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. Five words that God never said. God never said it. She added... She did. She added to God's word. Okay? And I want you to think about it. You have churches. Because a woman's always a type of a church. And you have churches all over the world that are adding things to God's word. The Jews did it. They added the Midrash. They added the Talmud. They added all of these things. By the time Jesus showed up, Jesus was aware of what they had done to God's law, and he told the Jews, you have by your traditions made the law void. Because you've added to it, and now you have ways to get around and bypassing the commandments. You've got ways to do it, and that's not what God said. They added to it. You have churches nowadays, even Protestant churches, adding to the Word of God, saying things that God never said. Adding commandments that God never commanded. Adding sins that God never added to the law. We've got enough problems just dealing with Ten Commandments. Why add more to it? But you've got people that do it. Okay? You've got Ellen White in the Seventh-day Adventist movement adding to God's Word by saying that you have to keep the Fourth Commandment in order to go to heaven. Where is that in the law? Where is that in the New Testament? It's not there. Okay? But that's what she did. You've got the uh, Jehovah's Witness. You've got the Mormons adding the Book of Mormon. You've got the Catholic Church adding all of the popes and all of what the bishops said. You've got people adding to the Word. That is not what God said. But anyway, uh, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So he lied to her. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, in one sense, their eyes were opened. But what were they open to? Not that they were gods. They were naked. And now, because of violating the law, they were ashamed of that nakedness. Okay? And I had this little theory about children. Okay? At a certain age, like Roland, okay, he can pull his diaper off and he's just happy as a lark, okay? But at a certain point, those children, they don't want to be naked anymore. They realize we need to cover up, we need to clothe, we need to put something on. We don't want to be seen this way child gets to that point, I believe that they're starting to realize their shame with nakedness. Amen? And then society is trying to teach them, oh no, take that stuff back off again. Ain't right. Anyway, so, let's, so that's, to me, that's where he gets the power of death, is in people breaking the law. When he convinces people that they can break the law, and he does, by the temptations that he gives to them, that's where he gets, I believe, the power over death. So, can Satan be overthrown? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. Colossians chapter 2. Turn there. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. First and second Thessalonians. Colossians chapter 2. Turn there. His overthrow. This is what I like. He can be defeated. But can you do it by yourself? No. Not by yourself. You need help. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 13. You know what? Let's go back. 
Let's go back to verse 10. Ye, us, the church, the saints, are complete in him, meaning Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. And we've been talking on Sunday nights about devils and their kingdom, and we've talked about principalities. Tonight we're going to get into powers a little bit. But he said in verse 11, In whom also ye are circumcised. Really? That's in the law? But it's with the circumcision made without hands. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So Christ, um, by the way, that shooting that took place yesterday. Okay? From what I saw on the news, just what briefly I could see, they were having a bris in this synagogue. You know what that is? Circumcision. They were circumcising babies in this temple when this guy went in shooting. They were performing circumcisions there. Okay? I just thought I'd throw that in. Thought it was interesting. Um, but anyway, does the circumcision of the flesh, does that profit anything? Because that's the law, right? No. Absolutely not. It's the putting off of the entire body. That's what profits. That's what he's talking about. The circumcision made without hands. Putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. Somebody say amen. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So how are we saved? How can we overcome the flesh? It is by the operation of God through faith, our trust in God, the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. God also hath raised us up by baptism and, raised, and will raise us up in the last day. Verse 13, and you being dead in your sins. Somebody say amen. What did Lazarus do to bring about his own resurrection? Not a thing. Not a thing. He had been dead four days. You stink when you're dead four days. Trust me. It's not good. Oh my goodness. I'd done it. I helped pick up a body four days dead. Old guy died in his trailer all alone. No family, nothing. And I went to help pick him up, Todd. If Robert says, you want to help me? Say no. <laughs> say no. Because I've helped him before, but they were kind of just dead. This guy, there was a deputy sheriff out there sitting on his car, sitting on his hood, and he told my brother-in-law, and he said, unless you see a gun or a knife under this guy, I don't want to know. <laughs> Meaning, we're not going in. Okay? And what happened was this guy lived in a trailer court, and his neighbors started, uh, something ain't right, TV had been on, Light had been on, and nobody to turn everything off. So, I didn't have to do the really bad part, but it was just bad enough going in there. Okay? And I'm telling you, your flesh is dead. It's dead already. It's dead in sins. And there is nothing about your flesh that God wants anything to do with. So don't tell me how good you are. Don't tell me how good you've been. Don't tell me what good you have done because you haven't done it. You haven't done it to satisfy the just demands of a holy God. Your body is dead already. We're keeping up with it and trying to put it off, but it's going to happen because of sins. And Lazarus dead four days cannot do anything.
to bring about his own resurrection. It takes the word of Jesus saying, Lazarus, come forth. Three words. The reason I'm for resurrection. Because we have sinned, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now Christ says to us, come, you come forth, whatever your name is. Okay? And we are resurrected by the word of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Through the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your own sins, or in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he... See, we're Gentiles. We're Gentiles. That's not what Gentiles do. The uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of what? How many of your trespasses did he forgive you of? All of them. All of them. Every one of them. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. What is that? The Ten Commandments. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Whether God wrote it on the tablets or Moses wrote it on the scroll, it's the handwriting of ordinances, and God has taken that because you broke it. You broke it. You broke the law. And God wrote it down that you broke the law because at the end there's books opened and you're judged by the, what you did in those books. They were written down. But when Christ came, he took his blood and blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Think about these two words, for us and against us. The law is not for us. It is against us. Why? Because we broke it repeatedly and still do. You didn't stop sinning. Don't give me that. You people on camera. Neither of you. Actually, I'm the one on camera. You guys on the other end. Never mind. Anyway, the law is against us. If God can be for us, who can be? This, listen, this, this King James Bible is right in what it says and how it says it. It says it better than any Bible that I've ever looked at in my life. It says it right. Because if God be for us, who then can be against us? And God is for us. And what does that mean? God's a cheerleader going, I'm for you. Come on. Sound like a politician. I'm for the working man. Right? No, God was in our place for us when Sweetie Pie has her surgery, I have to be for her, meaning she can't reach over and get her water to drink, so I have to get it for her because it hurts too bad, right? She can't do the laundry, so Lindsay, <laughs> I'm not doing it, <laughs> she don't want me doing laundry, because me, it's all black and white and red all over, amen? <laughs> it's all in the same pile. But anyway, somebody will do it for her, because she can't do it, she's not supposed to do it for herself or for us. Somebody has to be in your place. And so here are you in the seat of condemnation. Reg Kelly came here and preached this years ago and I've never forgotten him. I wish I had it somewhere. He preached, if God be for us, who can be against us? And what he said was, here is you in the seat of condemnation. Why? You broke the law. So here comes Christ and he takes us and puts us sitting in heavenly places and Christ comes and sits in the seat of condemnation. Now he's condemned and we're not. He is for us because the law was against us and he is in our place sitting. Here is righteous God sitting in the seat of condemnation. So, 
when the law comes after the seat of condemnation, who is it coming after, us or Christ? Who's in our place? Christ. So what can Moses say against Christ? Nothing. Did he break the law? No. What can Adam say against Christ? Adam says, he's not my son. He's the son of God. Amen? All the while, we're sitting at the right hand of the Father, or we're sitting in heavenly places, and here's, here's Christ sitting in the seat of condemnation. He is sitting for us in our place. So, the law which was contrary to us took it out of the way, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it where? Where did it say did he take, that he took it? Out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And a guy sent me that, I'll never forget this as long as I live, Ellen White, who founded the Seventh-day Adventist, said that she was transported by an angel to heaven. And she saw the Ten Commandments written, blazoned with glory, the Fourth Commandment shining brighter than the rest of them, saying, the angel telling her, that Christ nailed nine commandments to the cross, but not the Fourth Commandment. Meaning, an angel came from heaven to deliver to Ellen White another gospel saying, you've got to keep the fourth commandment, which is what? Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That you have to keep that one or you cannot be saved. That is a false gospel. Delivered by an angel to a woman. You get my meaning here? Think about it. Think about it. Okay? Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, here's what we know about Christ when he was on the cross. When they nailed him, what did they do with his garment? They took it from him. We don't have pictures of a naked Jesus on the cross, but more than likely, that's how he was. They took his garment off of him, and he is there bearing our shame. Don't you ever forget that. He's bearing our shame. The shame that was on us for sinning, Christ bore that to, our, to his cross, nailed it to his cross. He bore our shame. He bore our reproach, the Bible says. Took our sins off of us and nailed them, every one of them, to the cross. And that's where they stayed. Amen? They take him down. Three days later, he rises from the dead. He's not naked anymore, and neither are we. We're clothed with what? Righteousness, but not our own. We're clothed with His righteousness. What a sweet, what a sweet gift has been given to us freely. Freely. He has not demanded of us that we keep the law because we cannot and we have not and we did not and we will not this side of heaven we will not keep his law. Amen? I cannot preach this enough, and I will not ever be done preaching the gift, the immutable gift of Jesus Christ by taking my shame. Y'all know what I did? I ain't telling you. Do I know what you did? You haven't told me. And I don't want to hear it. But I know you did it. Because you're not any different than me. And I deserved to be very ashamed and exposed for who I am. I deserve it. But that's not what I got. 
Amen? When I get tired, I get emotional, so you just have to deal with that one. But I have not been exposed. Christ was. Because he bore my reproach and he bore my shame. And he's kept Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are covered, whose sins are hidden. Hidden. Let me hear you say amen to that. Aren't you glad? That he didn't write your name out in the, in the newspaper with a list of everything that you said, did, and thought. Because coveting is a thought one, isn't it? You guys are saved by the bells, all I'm saying. But look at this. This is how Satan is overthrown. This is it right here. By the cross. And nothing else. Amen? Father, what a gift. What a gift that you have given us in the cross. What a gift you have given us by having Jesus, who made a show of his enemies openly. And Lord, I've not even got into the scriptures on that. But he, made, he took our enemies, Satan, as Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And Father, Jesus made a show of all of his enemies, including Satan, openly on that cross, so that we would know, God, that our transgressions really are forgiven, and our sins are covered, and are, and are hidden, and our shame was borne by Jesus instead of us. So, Father, thank you for that immutable gift, that unchangeable gift that's still offered to mankind. And, Father, there's still people out there that need to know about that gift before it's too late. Thank you, God, for bringing us into this place, for teaching us your word. We love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.